Hey Reluctant Preppers, this is showing you just how easy it is to purchase silver without paying any premium over spot price. You just go to sdbullion.com slash rp, scroll down and enter the special code to get silver without any premium, and they'll mail it to your mailbox, discreetly packaged. Inside you'll find a beautiful 10 ounce bar of fine silver, and you are able to purchase that and have it and add it to your stack and your collection without paying any premium, and you're supporting reluctant preppers along the way. Thanks. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being, and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We are always glad when Rob Kirby visits us as a returning guest. He is a proprietary analyst of many markets, including precious metals and the economic and political scene. Rob, thank you for joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. Pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. Over the past year and a half, as we approached the end of the presidential election campaign in the U.S. and had this historic standout of an unconventional candidate in the person of Donald Trump who made a lot of provocative statements and a lot of surprise uh, actions that, that seemed to be uh, pulling all of the strings of the various media that, that he wasn't following the script. He was, he was you know, doing it his own way. And we had you on several times in, late in that season as well as after his election. You kept talking about the epic battle of globalists versus sovereign states and how Donald Trump was uh, probably one of the most noticed, noteworthy characters uh, riding on this wave of uh, populism and nationalist sentiment globally in the face of what seemed to be previously an almost unstoppable uh, barrage and kind of an unstoppable megatrend of globalist uh, pressure to basically get rid of borders, get rid of uh, boundaries between markets and all kinds of things like that. And uh, now that he, we've just passed the one-year anniversary of Trump's election, we'd really like to have you weigh in on uh, sort of a, a Trump one-year check-in as specifically if you could focus on what has Trump done that no other U.S. president has had the courage to do? And then in contrast to that, what has he not done specifically that you or others were hoping for and expecting? Well, Dunnigan, I look at, uh, or, or I think a great gauge of uh, Trump's performance at the one-year point uh, from his inauguration is maybe best summed up by, uh, uh, with Trump being the showman that he is and the, and the uh, individual that he is, uh, he celebrated his one-year uh, inauguration by uh, doing his own sort of uh, awards presentation where he named the uh, fake news uh, awards where I, I believe he crowned the uh, New York Times as the uh, fake news entity of the year. And... Uh, I mean, the the way the way that Trump has characterized the lamestream, bought off uh, press as the prostitutes that they are, and how completely and utterly in the tank the the mainstream press is for the uh, let's just say the old status quo, I think is. Uh, uh, it's it's a telltale and it's a, and it's a very good descriptor of how uh, President Trump has really taken the taken the uh, let's just say the mainstream press to task and uh, and has really outed them for being the uh, purveyors of uh, globalist garbage that they really are. So I think it's actually quite quite outstanding what he's done and what he's accomplished. And uh, on the flip side of that, what do you feel that he has not done that you were hoping and expecting him to do? I would say my biggest disappointment with the Trump administration to date has been the seeming lack of uh, 
uh, get up and go that that I would have anticipated uh, to see from uh, uh, Jeff Sessions in, in Justice, in that it seems to me that there's an extreme amount of evidence mounting of very nasty criminal wrongdoings on behalf of or on the part of uh, the Clinton machine, uh, the Clinton Foundation, and the, the uh, and the Obama administration as it pertains to uh, recent revelations uh, revelations of the uh, of the uh, FISA memo and details of which seem to be leaking into the media even today. And uh, also on the Trump uh, scorecard, there's this no doubt that since the, since the moment of his election and when the when the market took a temporary uh, panic plunge when it became clear that it was not going to be the heir apparent of uh, Hillary Clinton being being coronated um, as everyone had been predicting in the in the mainstream media but other than that the market has been on a tear upward since then uh, and some people uh, including uh, the billionaire Blackstone uh, CEO Schwartzman are giving Trump a majority of the credit, saying he's right to take credit for the booming stock market. Do you believe that Trump deserves any of or what what portion of the credit for the booming stock market? And do you see that as a healthy sign or an unhealthy sign? It it, it would appear to me that the uh, financial markets have become quite wrapped up in uh, uh, Trump's promised uh, and delivered uh, tax cut uh, a portion of his platform. Uh, but I, I view that, in all honesty, as a bit of a double-edged sword, and I think Trump might might want to might want to think about doing a little bit of a a, a back step in in that he's taken ownership of the stock market, and I and I think that that could uh, it's one thing to take ownership uh, of the performance of the stock market when it's going up, but if if the uh, if 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 the powers that be, uh, who I do believe are uh, the establishment, uh, if if they decide that they want to make Trump look bad, I do believe they have it within their power to engineer a collapse in the stock market, either through either through rising uh, or raising interest rates, or. Uh, uh, you know, or or through a, uh, I can I'll, I'm just going to say a host of other measures. If they tank the stock market on purpose to destroy uh, uh, the Trump uh, persona, uh, he will also have ownership of a of a collapsing equity market if if it were to arise. So I, I don't know that I would have advised uh, uh, Trump taking ownership of. Uh, this exuberance that's been uh, displayed in the in the equity markets quite the way he has. And um, separately from that, from the political uh, wisdom or lack thereof of of tying his you know his self rating to the to the market indexes, um, do you think the markets themselves uh, indicate that? Because the implication seems to be that booming markets and hitting record high after record high are signs of health in the economy. Uh, that seems to be what the the association that that Trump would like people to have, and others have have wanted that in the past as well. Um, your view of what the high record highs in the markets are signifying, and and whether you think it's a sign of health in the underlying economy or not. Well, I, I look at I look at what's going on, sort of from a maybe a little bit higher level, Dunnigan, in that we see record prices being paid for real estate in 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 centers around the world. We are looking at uh, record runs uh, up until extremely recently, record runs in the in the crypto area. And you see, I think a lot of the fuel for the run-ups in, 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 the, in the nominal prices of a lot of these uh, things, it, it emanates or stems from the creation of a lot more money uh, um, than is acknowledged to be in existence. And here I'd like to reference uh, something that I've spoken quite vocally about in recent months, uh, specifically the, uh, the, the 
documentation that the likes of uh, uh, Dr. Mark Skidmore, a PhD from Michigan State University, working in conjunction with Catherine Fitz of Solari.com, uh, they've identified that the U.S. military uh, has has somehow mis misspent or misplaced uh, something in the magnitude of twenty to twenty one trillion dollars uh, from the years nineteen ninety seven to twenty fifteen, uh, which is which is an insane amount of money. And we know that this money was in existence or came into existence because the uh, because the military uh, doesn't seem to know where they've where they've put it. And I, I would contend that this money has been created. It's dark. It's dark money. It's been fraudulently created. And the powers that be have siloed this money in in different areas and in slush funds. And these are the funds that they draw on from time to time to prop up the U.S. bond market, to prop up the U.S. equity market, or to restrain or cap the price of precious metals on the paper exchanges like uh, the COMEX and the LBMA. And these, uh, the, the moving the, or the, the suppression of the metals prices or the goosing of the equity markets and the bond markets uh, give the appearance uh, or support the narrative put forward by the powers that be that all is well in financial land and in the U.S. dollar land. Uh, be, but the reality, uh, from my point of view, seems to be much different that, than the, the most widely uh, pushed narrative that all is well in, the do in dollar land, because we've seen, we've seen record amounts uh, of nations uh, striking uh, trade deals with countries in the Asian uh, community, whether it's China, Iran, whether it's Russia, China, whether it's Pakistan, China, whether it's Venezuela, China, these countries are increasingly striking trade deals where, where they do uh, and settle their international trade accounts in other than dollars. And this, this, in my view, is a is a very very ominous development uh, for the for the dollar, and and the dollar's viability as the global uh, uh, currency for settling international accounts on a go forward basis. And I also believe that the the uh, the the people that have their hands or the people that have control of this fraudulently created 20 plus trillion dollars maybe getting maybe getting itchy itchy trigger fingers themselves uh, being being concerned that the US dollar could suffer a very severe fall in the very near future uh, due to many countries around the world abandoning the currency and if like if you if you think about it from a from a practical standpoint, if if you were sitting on a cache of twenty one trillion dollars yeah, of ill gotten dollars, dark dollars that were created fraudulently, and if you were maybe concerned that the rest of the world is getting jiggy to what you've done to create the, these dollars. Uh, you could start to get very concerned that these dollars could could soon be worth uh, substantially less than they are today. Um, and then I ask myself, if 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 such were the case, what would I then do with this nest of dollars that I'm I'm sitting on? Uh, logically, I would I would uh, try to uh, to preserve my purchasing power. I would start buying things that I, I would I would view to be or that have demonstrated that they hold value traditionally, and and I would start buying assets that would that would reprice if if the currency unit were to collapse, and uh, so things that I would name right off the top of my head I'd want to I'd want to buy uh, I'd want to buy real estate. Uh, 
you know, and in today's world, uh, I might be tempted to buy some uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and I might be tempted to also try to accumulate some physical precious metal. And it's long been rumored that the likes of JP Morgan have been doing just that. And JP Morgan is sort of uh, uh, generally is viewed in certainly in the alternative world or, you know, our alternative financial world. It's viewed as the uh, Federal Reserve's bank. And uh, they've long been rumored to been to have been amassing a very, very large physical cash of uh, silver, for instance, uh, while, while on the other hand, they are uh, also, uh, it's pretty well documented that they're one of the biggest sellers of pa paper silver on the, on the COMEX exchange. Well, on the other hand, they're, they're accumulating large stocks of physical metal. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just look at what, what factually they're doing. They're shorting paper and they're buying physical. Um, that's that that kind of move is very consistent with with the notion that they feel that money might not uh, be uh, maintaining its purchasing power on a go forward basis. So um, you know, the, so the reality is what we're told in the mainstream press isn't really supported by what we see empirically uh major players in the in the financial universe what they're actually doing yeah that reminds me of the old saying uh follow you know follow the money watch the money don't watch what they're saying watch what they're doing and uh also the sort of the bash and stash uh cliche that's that but as, when you start to see that acted out in in a major way in fact that's one of the you've, you've answered i think one of the viewers questions already um and we're going to be getting into those very soon. But I did want you to touch base, if we could, before we leave this topic. You mentioned cryptos in passing. Uh, just in your view currently, do you believe that the crypto run-up and subsequent uh, crash and sort of dead cat bounce since then has been a – is it is it part of a sustainable uh, rotation to a whole new era? Or do you believe that it's just been a speculative flash in the pan? Uh, you know, listen, the cryptos and and cryptology, uh, I, I would actually prefer to say cryptology or the cryptoization of assets, in my view, is is a is a uh, a trend which is going to only uh, strengthen over time, and I believe that the world will be much more cryptoized in five years than it is today, and. In saying this, I am not endorsing Bitcoin, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that the cryptoization, uh, uh, particularly the cryptoization of physical assets, brings a measure of transparency to the price discovery process uh, that I think is uh, tantamount to a return to honest commerce, which we don't currently have in our world today. Um, the you know whether whether or not uh, the having of the price of Bitcoin uh, means the end for Bitcoin, I'm I'm not really ready to say that's the case yet, because in 2013 Bitcoin got north of eleven hundred dollars a coin, and then you know in a year from then. Uh, we saw the price, uh, let's just say, crash again to like less than two hundred dollars. So, like from eleven hundred to two hundred is losing eighty percent of its value. We've seen this happen before, and you know, I mean, one could argue and say, well, boy, three years ago or four years ago, Bitcoin lost eighty percent of its value. And then went on to much, much bigger highs. Now it's lost 50% of its value, appears to be rebounding a little bit. I mean, uh, on a percentage basis, we've seen worse drops in Bitcoin. That's all I'm pointing out. And like I say, that's not an endorsement of Bitcoin. I'm just saying the ride, the ride in these cryptocurrencies 
has been extremely volatile. And the reason that the ride in cryptocurrencies, I would believe, the reason it's been so extremely volatile is because we live in a world today where an insane amount of money has been pumped into the system. An awful lot of money that's in the system isn't even acknowledged to exist. And cryptocurrencies uh, happen to be the closest thing probably we have in the world to free markets, where, where, the, where the long hand or long arm of the government and the central planners uh, isn't, isn't in there absolutely managing the price on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, would, and I would believe and have it that all that we're seeing in the crypto space is what, what the precious metals would be doing if they weren't managed to the extent that they are. So I guess that's, that's kind of sort of my take on it. Right. And uh, it's interesting. Just saw a recent uh, video produced by Mike Maloney from goldsilver.com talking about the big differences between different crypto technologies and how fast things are moving in that space and how some later uh, follow-on technologies such as a hash graph are overcoming uh, many orders of magnitude, the speed uh, problems and scale problems that, for example, Bitcoin ex uh, exhibits. So just for people who are uh, still interested in learning more about that, um, might want to look that up uh, from Mike Maloney and just realizing that things are, are continuing to change fast there. But it, a lot of those principles that you talked about as far as um, decentralization and uh, accountability and integrity and the, the, it's changing the game back to uh, where you can expect price discovery to be possible. Um, and th uh, that's another thing that uh, is uh, raising the concern of some of those who would like to come out and crush and, you know, uh, outlaw or or limit or um, put clamps down on cryptos are some of the established power structure. And at the right now up happening in... Uh, Davos, uh, Switzerland, is the World Economic Forum, and one of the speakers there so far has been India's uh, Modi, who's, who says anti-globalization and isolationist trends must be stopped. So there seems to be quite a bit of um, uh, th voices there from these elite power uh, players at the World Economic Forum talking about the, the desirability of globalism. But Trump is going to be speaking there this week. And what do you expect? That almost sounds like the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. What do you expect to happen when Trump speaks at the World Economic Forum? Well, I, I find it a little bit peculiar and odd that Trump has decided to make an appearance at uh, in, in Davos and and to uh, and 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 to even bother speaking to uh, the globalist clique. But I I have it in my head that Trump being the showman that he is and Trump having the contempt for the globalists that he has, I wonder to myself out loud whether he might have, have a nice little, little surprise and little treat for the globalists on their own turf event and whether he might make an appearance on Friday, and that's when he's due to speak, Friday afternoon, which is a very quiet time, as almost like a getaway date uh, for the Davos crowd. And it makes me wonder whether he might end up making an appearance on stage and walk up to the microphone, possibly with the likes of uh, uh, Julian Assange uh, at his side and uh, uh, maybe creating a bit of a spectacle uh, in a globalist, you know, own tent so to speak, um, and whether whether he might you know walk up to the microphone and say I'd like to introduce you all to uh, some you know somebody who's done gallant work uh, in exposing uh, criminality of of the globalist uh, cabal, and uh, I, I just happen to have something in my back pocket here. It's uh, it sort of feels like it might be a might be a pardon, and. Uh, it just seems to me that this might be the sort of thing that Donald Trump, the showman, and Donald Trump, the uh, you know don't mess with me kind of guy, 
I think he is, uh, might might actually would sort of throw a spanner in the uh, in the globalist camp spokes, so to speak, if he were to do such a thing. And I wouldn't rule it out. I know it might sound a little bit outrageous, but I I think I think Trump's uh, I think Trump's been doing some rather outrageous things in 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 recent. Uh, recent days and recent weeks with some of his proclamations and some of his uh, executive orders. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say one thing. The man certainly does seem to have cojones. And uh, with the with the revelations that are bubbling up from the, uh, from the top secret FISA memo, uh, much of the content of which has been pretty much leaked out, in terms of what the powers that be, uh, the lengths the powers that be have gone to try to prevent him from uh, not only winning the uh, uh, winning the Republican nomination, but uh, you know to to, to uh, actually win the election, and uh, uh, you know it, it would seem to me that he's been in mortal danger. From the time he declared that he was uh, a serious candidate to run, and, uh, and and it would seem to me that he might still be in mortal danger. And you know, the guy has stood. The guy has certainly stood tall, and uh, he seems to be committed to trying to execute his uh, his agenda. Well, we'll certainly know more within a week here, and and it is a it is a remarkable time. He certainly a, a does continue to defy. A recent convention and break the mold and frankly I think that's why a lot of people uh, do watch and listen whether they're for him or against him they they recognize that uh, he's not just marching to the uh, the, the standard uh, game plan so that that's refreshing at least we have uh, an, about a half a dozen different viewer questions we'd like to hit with you um, one of these you've already touched on but I think it has a twist at the end to, to get you to, to um, weigh in on it Says this is from Without Excuse 2011 Rob we know three facts first the criminal organization J.P. Morgan Chase holds at least 100 million ounces of physical silver some people believe much more than 100 million ounces second whenever they wish they are able to toss out quote paper silver equal to many times the entire world's production of silver third there is zero accountability, never any serious legal consequences for their crimes. Given those three facts, would you agree that they can and likely will continue manipulating the silver market indefinitely unless the rule of law puts an end to their crimes, locks up Jamie Dimon, question mark? Of course, we have no rule of law. So the question being, and people can disagree about those exact numbers that were, were being tossed out there, but the principles are, are uh, proposed. Given those facts, do you agree that this manipulation or apparent manipulation of the silver market can continue indefinitely. Well, first I'd like to su uh, suggest that the reason why the manipulation has gone on as long as it has is that we have, uh, or um, America has, uh, regulators that don't regulate. Mm -hmm. And the reason, and the reason regulators don't regulate, is that the suppression of metals is actually a policy of the, <laughs> the uh, uh, U.S. Treasury, and. Uh, the the suppression of price uh, can be maintained as long as the demand for physical metal does not uh, let's just say uh, overpower um, the ability to supply physical metal and th there have been lots of constructs in place to keep people from demanding physical metal uh, in, in in the past and. You know, this is evidenced by the uh, advent of a lot of COMEX uh, longs being uh, shunted, effectively shunted to the LBMA market through uh, EFPs, exchange, uh, exchanges for physical, where uh, the COMEX does not seem to be able to uh, settle the uh, uh, people demanding physical from their exchange, and uh, my 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 gut tells me that this this year, 2018, the demand for physical metal could very well overwhelm the uh, ability of uh, paper shorts uh, to suppress the price. And be and the reason I say this is because foreign demand for physical metal 
continues to grow unabated. And uh, the, uh, you know, at some point, the paper shorts of, uh, of metal have to put up or, or be shown to be fraudsters that they are. So, uh, and, and, you know, refusing to regulate will not, will not prevent that reality from showing itself to be what it is. Uh, if if the demand for physical is sufficiently high, which which I believe we very likely see this year. Another question regarding silver and the trends, and this one specifically how it's compared with the dollar. This is from David Cisco. He asks, why is the dollar down at the same time silver is down? In one year, dollar down eleven percent, silver down two and a half percent. Well, I mean, the the a lot of people believe that the uh, uh, believe that the metals are um, uh, highly correlated to the dollar, um, and on a historical basis, uh, yes, there there was a there was a a very high degree of correlation between the dollar and the and the and the metals prices, but with with the with the suppression of metals prices. Or, or the let's just say the suppression of paper metal prices being as severe as it has, uh, making heads or tails of, of historic relationships between between the dollar and and metals prices is, is not is not as uh, is not the vanilla exercise it used to be, and like it, it used to be it used to be when unemployment rates went to uh, you know, historic lows. Uh, you know, the bond market would back up and and would would throttle up, uh, uh, and yields would it would it would increase dramatically. But you know, we don't really, or at least in my view, we still haven't seen yields increase dramatically. Like I don't view a two and a half or two two point six interest rate on the ten year bond as being as as being high. It's you know, from an historical standpoint, it's still exceptionally low, and and, and the reality is bond bond prices bond prices are controlled through derivatives, inter, namely interest rate derivatives, and so so the, the the price discovery process in the bond market is broken, the price discovery process in the metals market is broken, the price discovery process in the equity markets is broken. So why should we be surprised that, you know, something doesn't seem the way it should be uh, uh, regarding uh, silver versus the value of the dollar? Okay, right, because there was an underlying assumption that probably underlied that question. It says, why is the dollar down at the same time silver is down? They're probably the underlying assumption is that there'd be a natural um, – foundational relationship between those two that would go the other direction and you're saying any assumptions you're making about natural relationships is out the window here in such a completely manipulated market because a lot of people assume that we actually have markets you know and i would argue that we really don't have markets anymore what we have is contrivances and 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 you know interferences that's what we have and that's what we're witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis now you touched on this next one about interest rates, but if we could, it does zero in a little bit more. If you could get some help here, Advar Stalemo says, "How are interest rates determined? To what degree is it set by the market, and to what degree is it set by central banks? Does the Fed have influence over the entire bond market, or just short-term rates?" Well, I don't believe interest rates are set by the Fed, and I don't believe they're set by the market. I think interest rates are decided uh, ahead ahead of time in the U.S. Treasury. And, you know, it kind of sort of makes sense when, when you when you or if you want to consider that the largest debtor in the world is the U.S. government. And, you know, when 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 you're the when you're the largest user of something or the largest uh, uh, consumer of something in the world or the biggest player uh, of, uh, of something in the world, uh, it's quite natural that you'd have a, an enormous amount of influence on on whatever that is, and if we look if we look at the size of the magnificent five, as I like to refer to them, if we look at the size of their derivatives books, and then consider uh, that these derivatives books are largely constituted of interest rate derivatives, and if you want to consider the quality of the credits 
uh, of some of these institutions and, and, and look at their book size and understand that these interest rate derivatives are, are actually credit instruments, you, you, you would quickly realize or you would come to the conclusion if you thought it through that the banking community, the banking community in 2008, the global banking community would never have done $8 trillion worth of interest rate derivatives with, with Morgan Stanley when it looked like they were going to fail. Because no, because no bank in the world or collection of banks in the world would subject themselves to that kind of risk, especially in light that within a year of that event, uh, uh, Bear Stearns had failed, Lehman had gone under. And I mean, the Fed, the Fed was trying to marry Morgan Stanley to anybody they could, and they couldn't get anyone to even consider it. And, but yet they were able to grow uh, uh, you know, their derivatives book by eight trillion in three months, eight trillion in notional in three months. Well, you know what? You need you need to have viable credit lines to even consider doing that. You need to have enormous credit lines with with counterparties in the banking community to do that. And I can tell you something: at the time when Morgan Stanley grew their book that that in in that fashion in three months. Uh, banks weren't even lending to each other on an overnight basis. So the notion that, you know, an entity like Morgan Stanley could grow their, grow their swap book by $8 trillion in three months, that absolutely is a red flag telling you it's the Treasury doing deals with Morgan Stanley because, because the Federal Reserve wouldn't do that trade. That was the Treasury recapitalizing Morgan Stanley on the sly utilizing interest rate derivatives. So that's that's how we know it's the treasury in the market doing the derivatives with the banks uh, to set interest rate policy. And you see, when, when the treasury does this, they do it through the exchange stabilization fund, which is a very secretive arm of the U.S. Treasury. And, and, and this ultimately is the, is the arbiter of what interest rates are going to be. And how they're set, and uh, but of course the the exchange stabilization fund and the U.S. Treasury are more than happy to sit on their hands and and deflect and allow the uh, Federal Reserve take all the heat. And you know, and if anybody wants to go and 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 enlighten themselves a little bit about the activities that go on in the exchange stabilization fund. And I've said it before, I'm sure with you, and in, and in other outlets, go to, go to the website marketskeptics.com and look in the right-hand uh, margin for uh, a heading uh, uh, by uh, Eric de Carbonell, where, where he states something I've been afraid to blog about for a long time. And if you click on the link, it'll take you to a five-part YouTube uh, 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 series um, on on what the exchange stabilization fund is and how it operates, and I mean, you know, it outlines it outlines in that little mini documentary uh, that the the ESF the ESF is involved in more things than anybody could ever imagine, and they're more than willing to allow the Federal Reserve take take all the credit or take all the heat, but anyway. I, I would recommend people do this because it explains it explains and and if you understand how how uh, interest rate derivatives are are traded and how they're settled, um, you know it 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 really makes sense. It's like a it's like it's like following a trail of breadcrumbs, uh, 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 you know, to to a to to a treasure, and it's and it's and it's very 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 uh, at least it's clear to me because. I know what goes. I know what goes into transacting these these uh, uh, these derivatives because I I was a broker of them for many years, and uh, and 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 when I and when I did, um, you know, I happened to have a have a client who was the biggest at it in the world. So I know how they work. I know how they're settled, and I know how the credit aspect of these things work. And I know there's no way that Morgan Stanley did eight trillion dollars with banks. In three months, when they were when they were on their knees and near bankruptcy, because 
because I actually I actually was a broker of these instruments and in, in really challenging uh, uh, credit environments in, in, in 1989. And in 1989, when we had a when we had a credit crisis, uh, the interbank market for these for these interest rate products it seized up. Nobody was trading. And, and the reason nobody would trade is because everyone was afraid that their counterparty might go bankrupt. Okay. So they stopped trading. But, but hey, Morgan Stanley, when they're on their knees and, 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 and close to being, uh, uh, you know, being executed, you know, they, they strap on $8 trillion worth. Well, you know, that's like me telling you that I had an elephant jump through a firehouse. Mm-hmm. That just doesn't happen. It's a good visual, though. So uh, the next question uh, does have to do similarly with uh, silver. And in the case of a uh, of a hyperinflation, John Burkett asks, when hyperinflation kicks in, do you see barter as being a practical alter- alternative? For example, can you purchase food at your local grocery store with silver coins in that case? And if not, do you think something like a gold money credit card is a good idea. Uh, listen, um, you know, barter, barter's been around since the beginning of time, and barter's never going to go away. And I mean, our current our current fiat monetary system is actually uh, principally it's it's modeled on barter anyway. I mean, a gold standard really is barter. I mean. Paper money, when it was first invented, was was really just a substitute for gold that was supposed to be in the vault. But the alchemists who controlled the money realized that they didn't need to keep all the gold on hand uh, for 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 the uh, for the for the chattels that they had issued for it. And with and you know and this and this this ultimately led to monkey business. And the monkey business has become much more sophisticated. Because we have, uh, you know, we have financially engineered products, and we have regulators that don't regulate, and uh, you know, and 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 the, and the dollar and the dollar amounts have grown incredibly in size. Uh, but I mean, barter is. I'm okay with barter. Barter is honest commerce. Sure. You know, you know, a sheep for a goat. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. value for value. Value for value, it, I'm okay with that. So, like, I'm okay with I'm okay with any movement towards honest commerce, and that's why I'm also okay with the cryptoization of assets because it brings a degree of transparency and believability to the price discovery process. You see, when you cryptoize a physical asset, you can only sell it once. The problems that we we've we've run into in the in the Precious metals markets is you've got organizations like Comex who have an ounce of gold in in the vault and they sell it three to five hundred times over. If if you cryptoize that ounce of gold, you can only sell it once. We've heard that that statistic multiple times, and some people say a hundred times, some people say three hundred times, some people say five hundred times. Are they specifically referring? Do you know what the what the referent is there? Are they talking about things like? Um, SLV and GLD or other ETFs where you you buy sort of a share that's supposed to be tied to the price of the underlying or is there something more even more uh, direct than that where people are actually purchasing uh, metals that are held on in in storage for them that sort of thing and, and they're being oversold well, well for, for me Dunnigan I look at uh, like for instance with COMEX you can count up you can count up the ounces because they publish it on and, and adjust it on a daily basis you can count up the number of ounces they claim to have in the vaults. Then you can look at the open interest, and for every contract of open interest there is, uh, you know that that represents the sale of 100 ounces of gold. So you know if there are 500,000 uh, uh, gold contracts in open interest, you know 500,000 times 100. That's that's how much gold has been sold, and uh, uh, in paper form. And you know that, that 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 number just happens to dwarf the amount of gold they have in, in their vaults. Should should people demand delivery? And you know, and, and and in recent and in recent days and weeks, 
we've seen we've seen through the settlement process, which which isn't transparent either. Uh, we've seen the COMEX shunt the demands for delivery off to the London Exchange, where they're dealt with in in I, I would I would I would suggest to you they're dealt with in a different way in London. What happens when they shunt these demands for delivery? Uh, when they shunt them over there, uh, uh, a lot of times, and I, and I know this because I know people who've been involved in the settlement process personally, uh, people get offered premiums to settle off market. So if you if you're due or owed, uh, you know, a hundred ounces of gold at uh, uh, through a through a Comex contract. And uh, let's just say that you bought it at thirteen hundred dollars, or, or ostensibly you're owed gold a hundred ounces at thirteen hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, uh, an exchange for physical is you're shunted to the London exchange, where where somebody might approach you and say, "Well, you know, we'd be more than happy to if you want to just forget about this. Uh, what if what if we paid you uh, two or three hundred or four hundred dollars per ounce?" to just make this go away. And these sort of things happen. These things really do happen. So people get bribed to people and institutions and entities get bribed to uh, uh, effectively take, take the fiat and, uh, you know, and, 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 and play again. And, and people who don't want to play ball on that basis, uh, you know, m might find themselves might find themselves being investigated uh, by regulators for wrongdoing, possible uh, maybe maybe wire fraud, maybe maybe uh, uh, tax evasion, uh, maybe laundering uh, uh, you know a hyped up charge of laundering money. Uh, the system has many ways to make people comply. Uh, just just as just as Robert Mueller has has uh, 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 laid charges on Paul Manafort, trying to turn him and and, and get him to bear false witness against uh, the sitting president in your country. Uh, he's he's trumped up charges on him uh, at using leverage. And you know, it, and it's and it's and it's not a mystery that he's told him if he wants to bear false witness against the president, he'll be let out of his charges. And this 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 is the kind of leverage that the powers that be use to keep the system operating in in a in a in a fashion that's congruent with their narrative. And it's garbage, and it's all starting to unravel because these. FISA memo uh, uh, revelations that are now bubbling up are telling us how corrupt and rotten the system is. And the system isn't just rotten from a geopolitical standpoint. It's rotten from a financial standpoint. Probably even more rotten on the financial end than it is geopolitically. And it's all coming out. It's all coming home to roost. This is why globalism is failing. And this is why populism is rising. And this is why people are, are starting to get some nationalist sentiment. Because people realize that they've been, they've been lied to, they've been, they've been stolen from, and they've been abused by corrupt leaders. Because there's been a coup in America. And people, unscrupulous, evil people, have taken control. And you know what? And Trump's trying to put an end to it, which is why he's in mortal danger. It certainly is remarkable times that we're living in. It certainly seems that we are reaching a cusp and a, and a climactic crisis point. And uh, it's going to be um, interesting, exciting, perhaps perilous. And uh, we don't know how many of us are going to survive this that's one of the things that we talk about on our channel is uh, awareness so that we can be prepared but it's a little bit um, stymieing to a lot of us to figure out how extensive the um, hard times are that we're going to be preparing for and uh, that's the last two questions we have focus on that uh, the uh, next person uh, named they are lying to you asks 
and this is something that it's difficult to predict, but at least you can give us your perspective on it. Is the UK economy going to implode before Europe implodes? Either way, will these two events set the stage for the US to crash? And where will China and Russia's economies be while all this takes place? And finally, how will gold, silver, and the cryptos fare in this whole meltdown? So just your view of what a, a likely or possible scenario of, of kind of the order of these dominoes falling across the globe. I think the Western world's in big trouble because the Western world is so, is so uh, uh, married to fiat money where, where – and I'm not saying that Russia and China are not married to fiat money too, but – Russia, just remember everybody, Russia failed as an economy uh, and went bankrupt in 1989, 90, or in the early 90s, uh, where, where it played out. And uh, the one thing that Russia, uh, uh, I mean, not, not that we wish fail, uh, economic failure on anyone, but in Russia, the state basically owned everything, being, be, being a communist uh, central planned economy like real estate was not really uh, owned by a lot of people uh, there was no stock market to speak of where people had equity and, and companies in Russia because the state owned everything uh, in, in, in the western world it's a lot different people have ownership or they think they have ownership of property they think they have meaningful equity in companies in, that are supposedly in the private sector, and people have enormous amounts of debt. And when the crap hits the fan, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who, who think they have ownership in 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 or you know, they're, they're going to find out that they don't own much, and the banks will own everything. And uh, so uh, the debt's a big problem, and we have debt like Russia never did when they when they collapsed. Um, um, because you know rates 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 in Russia were never were never forced to zero, and uh, you know rates were reflective that you know they, they were going to fail. But we don't have rates reflective that anything's a mess here. We have rates that have been forced, basically forced to zero, and remain close to zero. And so, the the uh, the the notion of a default hasn't been priced into our markets at all. And you know, and people say, well, we we could never default. And anybody who thinks we can never default, I just say, hey, folks, just just remember back in the financial crisis, two thousand seven, eight, nine. Triple A, triple A rated mortgage paper failed. That was the first time triple A had ever failed in the history of capital markets. And if you and if you think that the United States government can't fail with the debt that they have, uh, I would say think again. And a currency that's highly suspect, with with countries around the world abandoning the currency in trade, I mean. You know this. So so anyway, I think things could get really messy, and could get really messy really quick. And I think I think frankly, all countries in the Western world are all are all in a in a, in a very perilous position, and are in are, and are sailing are sailing into uncharted waters, in in and metaphorically in a boat that's not very seaworthy. And you know. The only way I, I think reasonably people can reinforce their boat or make their boat more seaworthy is by owning some physical precious metal. Because when you own physical precious metal, you have no counterparty risk. And metal in your hand uh, uh, you know, is something that you have. Whereas a uh, U.S. government bond uh, that's redeemable by the government in fiat money. Um, you know they can print the money and hand it to you, but you know what will it buy? And when when uh, uh, very challenging uh, things happen in, in in the in the credit markets, uh, precious metal historically has has repriced itself 
to maintain purchasing power when when things fall apart. So it's the ultimate insurance. So it's it's so you know and and so so what's the so what's the value of holding physical precious metal? I'm going to suggest to you it's very similar to the value of a of an insurance policy if your house burns down. It allows you to get back on your feet. And in that kind of a scenario, the last part of the question was, so yeah, I think you've answered the first two parts of it. The last part was, how do you think, in addition to gold and silver, that cryptos will fare in a in a international mul- economic meltdown? I think I think that tangibles that have been cryptoized will do very well, uh, and 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 cryptos cryptos that have nothing backing them might might end up being you know the Napsters and the Nortels of the world. I mean, listen. There's going to be winners and losers in in the crypto space. You know, to 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 to, to equate the crypto space to the high tech space, uh, you know, the crypto space will have its share of Napsters and and Nortels and Dogfood.com that go bust. But out of out of the crypto space will come the 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 equivalents of Amazon and Netflix and Apple. And I'm not saying that Bitcoin is going to be Amazon, but what I'm saying is there will be Amazons. Turning back to the potential of a financial collapse, the last question comes from the user, the user named Old World Order. In the event of a financial collapse, what would it look like for the average man? How long before a restructure takes place where goods, foods, and services normalize comparable to those we have enjoyed in the past in the West, if ever? I think supply chains could become very challenging, which is why it's probably a good idea to own some storable food. Um, and I and I and I think this just underlines and underscores the notion that you know ownership of some physical precious metals makes some sense, because I honestly believe you will always be able to barter them. Additionally, there's a follow-on question here. Additionally, please discuss. If this is a Weimar Venezuela type collapse, Weimar or Venezuela type collapse, what would an average property cost in the EU or the US, etc., be in silver or gold ounces or in cryptos, depending on your view of whether cryptos will fail or thrive as societal normalization ensues? Um, obviously, there's no simple answer to this question, but just uh, I think you talked about a few minutes ago, like an insurance policy that allows you to get back on your feet. It's basically you haven't lost all your all your value you've got some you've got some nest egg left there if you've got if you've got something that has you know persistent value um but do you have any kind of and it's it's difficult to i guess talking about pricing a pricing a property in terms of ounces of metal no you, you, that's no no that's that's just that's a fool's errand to try and answer that question in, in an absolute number but it you know because i view it done again a little bit more like this if if, if the ownership of physical precious metal and things that retain value will be like chips in a poker game. So the question is, uh, or, 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 the, or the, the real point is, uh, you, will, you will always be able to buy real estate with precious metal. But there might come a time when you cannot buy real estate with dollars. Right. I get that. That gets back to your comment about bartering with value. Yeah. The real question is: uh, Do you, if, if assuming you're going to want to live, and and you're in the game of poker, would you rather have some chips or would you rather have none? I would rather have some. It sure has been an interesting year with the the explosion of crypto prices after uh and and people in the precious metals uh real money and and real value a camp have been uh ridiculed as being dinosaurs as being old fashioned as being stuck in the in the past and not embracing the future and that kind of thing and yet it seems that somehow uh that concept as you mentioned of exchanging real value for real value uh emerges throughout history and and it makes absolute gut sense it it passes the gut check that 
as long as you have something with that contains value, you should be able to exchange it for other things of value that you need and that your family cares about in the future. Rob, is there any final uh, words you can give us on where people can find more of your work? Well, you can find me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. And uh, I don't know, parting words, you know, be long, be long and strong on tangible real stuff. That's certainly a standard it's to the test of time, and uh, we're always grateful for you weighing in on what current events are indicating to us about what's likely to be coming up near term and uh, what major trends are affecting us, and so that we can be aware and prepared. It'll be very interesting to see how this uh, World Economic Forum plays out and uh, also what lies ahead near term uh, for, the, for the precious metals markets and uh, for our economic uh, health as a, as a whole. But no matter what happens, we're grateful for your perspective here, uh, keep, keeping us more informed so we can be more aware and prepared here on Reluctant Preppers. Rob, thanks for joining us again. Uh, my pleasure, Donnie.